Welcome to the Thoughtful Gamer Podcast, episode number 81. As always, my name is Mark. Here with me today is Dan Kazmaier from Steeped Games. We're going to be talking about their new game on Kickstarter right now, Chai Tea for Two. I've already released uh, the original game Chai, which is all about tea, as you can probably guess. Thanks for coming on, Dan. Hey, no worries. Thanks for having me, Mark. No problem. I am very excited because I love tea. And obviously, I love board games, and uh, this is a board game about tea, which is a great subject. Let's let's start with just talking about uh, the Chai games. So it's now a, a series. Sure. You got the base game, you got the two player game. Now, uh, what was the inspiration for that? Uh, my wife Connie, I've been married five and a half years. She used to collect uh, tea mugs, and David's tea up here in Canada is a big deal. So kind of you know periphery, enjoying tea, and just decided to hop in full force. Um, just having a lot of board gamers enjoy tea is also a lot of fun, and we've been learning more about tea than games over the past few years. And what was the process like? So Chai was your, your first game designed, right, that you, that you designed? Totally. I guess, you know, a lot or of us growing up completion. Kid, Yeah, yeah. <laughs> totally. Like, we'd read The Hobbit or Lord of the Rings and some little adventure thing, but, um, yeah, we started making it in March of, I believe, three years ago and then we launched the campaign in december that year uh it's a little bit lighter so like a, a gateway family game more streamlined rules but the development was a lot of fun we threw up a free print and play online and had about a thousand blind play testers uh download the pdf and give it a try so that was really helpful as a first-time creator kind of outsourcing the uh play testing or development work that's interesting so it was only a matter of a few months from when you started designing the game to the kickstarter Totally. Um, wow. There's a comp company, Roxley, in town, um, famously known for Brass, Santorini. So they've been super helpful along the journey. Um, before the pandemic, we'd even play soccer on Tuesday nights. Yeah, and they said it takes a good, you know, two to three years to publish a game truly through another publisher. So we thought, well, we have a little bit of a background in wedding photography, graphic design. I used to do the marketing for a college. Um, all their layouts for like alumni stuff and manuals and whatnot. So uh, yeah, decided to give it a whirl and found a few artists. Chai is famously known from India, you know, the spiced black tea beverage. So we found a, a wonderful um, artist, Sahana from India, so she could properly represent the tea culture there. And uh, yeah, stayed true to her vision, but really had a lot of helpful people in the community, the board game community, um, help us. That's fantastic, yeah. And the first game uh, was obviously successful on Kickstarter. What was what was that like? Like running your first Kickstarter, like beyond like making the game. <laughs> I feel like the, the the process of like putting it up on Kickstarter and just like watching the numbers has to be super stressful. Totally, <laughs> it happened right during Christmas as well. So my dad is just enamored with it. He's like, "Son, this is you know better than the slot machines. Let's throw it up on the big seventy inch." um tv during christmas dinners and all the relatives are there and it's just super stressful where um the campaign becomes 24 7. um you're like should i go to sleep i just saw 10 more kickstarter comments come in yeah like having regrets of eating junk food and i really wish i had been coached a bit more heading into the first one because we get really intense whether it's i guess board games or now tea so we uh, wanted to do it very well, but at the same time, weren't sure how to have proper healthy boundaries. So if anyone is listening and is starting up their Kickstarter, I'd be you know, more than happy to share some of the uh, things we learned. Right now we're running our third campaign and I'm a little bit more relaxed and we got some really nice frozen lasagna. So <laughs> yeah, we're prepared. Eating better. That's that's always good. Yeah, because I, I looked it up, and uh, you've already you've already met your goal for the for the two player sequel here pretty quickly. It seems. How, how many days has it been up? Only a couple days. I think we funded in seven hours yesterday. Oh wow! And we're, we're like maybe nineteen hours in, something like that. We started after lunch because we're having some issues with uh, the little jiffies, the animations on the page. Probably should have launched it earlier and called it. You know, but that's the problem with being a perfectionist. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So uh, tell me about this uh, two player version of uh, the original game. How did was was that 
kind of always in the back of your mind or was it a result of the success of the first game? How did, how did this come to be? Honestly, probably the result of the success of Chai. Um, funny story, for Chai, um, we have different player colors, of course. So uh, Oolong is blue because that's sometimes traditionally marketed in stores. Black, white tea, green tea. And we had to find a red player, so we added Roybus to the game. We quickly discovered um, that many tea purists would not describe that as a tea because it's a, it's a herbal, right? Different plant. Um, yeah, different plants altogether. And hey, we just wanted a cool red player, um, kind of like a laurel type leaf. And uh, it is awesome, but it wasn't truly tea. So uh, in our next game, Tea for Tea, we thought, hey, let's just honor the tea traditions. Let's make sure we're doing things right. Um, we borrowed like 15 tea books. I actually have one here on the desk for reference. Um, and I was flipping through it, we came across, here we go. It's uh, the tea production chart. Okay. So you have everything from oxidization to withering, um, fermentation at the end, where typically the oolong and black tea is wet and then it dries over time. So you get that lovely musty smell and taste. So. We were thinking, why don't we just make a game that focuses on the production of tea? Um, that's kind of where it started. There was a game design conference in our province, and uh, it was like a week away. So I pulled an all-nighter, just staring at that chart, trying to make it abstractly into a game. And we play tested it a few times and really liked where it was going. So yeah, just really thankful that there's things that exist in the natural world and manufacturing processes that easily translate into um, you know, systems and hopefully mechanics. So, so the game started as how do we turn the process of making tea into a game? Uh, was it always planned to be a two player game or did you consider making it also a multiplayer game? Totally a fair question. Yeah. And I had one friend in another publishing company be like, this is awesome. Why don't you make this a four or five player game? Maybe we'll add an expansion down the road. We just announced online that uh, we're expecting a baby for November, so maybe it's tea for three down the road. Oh, or... <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. Uh, who knows if there's going to be an expansion or not, but just because Connie and I love playing games like after dinner primarily, it, it just made sense. Hey, it's COVID times. Let's play test just for two. Um, there's a solo mode as well, a bit of an AI um, Automa, but apart from that, yeah, I think the world needs some really nice two-player games, and uh, the community was asking for that as we already have a five player game. Yeah, that's very cool. And so in terms of the mechanics of it, so I, I, I believe I played a demo of Chai a long time ago and correct me if I'm wrong, it's it's sort of a uh, contract fulfillment thing, right? Totally, or, yeah. yeah. Uh, is, is Chai Tea for Two along those same lines? But it, it sounds like it's, it, it has a different mechanical base than that. Yeah, uh, same universe or world of Chai, uh, like we have the same tea tokens, but now we've introduced yellow and fermented and blue air teas, but um, totally different mechanics. So that was kind of, it's an interesting design challenge to try to make something that um, has constraints and that was super helpful for us. So it also had to be accessible to our earlier crowd for chai, uh, family friendly, but then we wanted to make it a light to medium euro in a two player box. So that's kind of our sweet spot as well. We really enjoy games like uh, Imhotep, uh, where you have like crunchy decisions, but the rule overhead isn't too much. So specifically for this game, it's a dice worker placement um, and then card engine building, kind of with a, a pickup and deliver system. So you're still doing the recipes, which harkens back to the first game. The ships were requiring different types of tea. You're making that tea, and then you're creating an engine to quickly run it up the board. Um, Quinn's from Shut Up and Sit Down, he said it's like a reverse pachinko board. It kind of goes doo -doo -doo <laughs> up the board. So um, yeah, we hadn't really found a mechanic that does that. So it, it was kind of just born through, uh, again, looking at the production T chart and what would be a fun way to try to, you know, make an engine. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, we, like we even enjoy really simple engine builders like Splendor. Um, so there's totally a way that we can do that and uh we're kind of happy with where it's at right now doing little tweaks but 
yeah, it's uh, it's been a thing in development for a couple of years. Let's let's go back a bit. Let's I, w- I want to hear more about how you got started in board games. Now we've talked about these particular games. What what was kind of your entry point into our world of uh, modern board games? Totally. Um, I guess I have the horror story as a five year old learning Risk, <laughs> and you know my dad crushing me in North America after telling me it was a good strategy. Um, and the loser had to put away the pieces, so my <laughs> tears falling down my cheek at like an ungodly hour in the evening, and um, playing Civilization and Age of Empires. So that was a lot of fun as a kid. Um, I had severe asthma going into junior high, so I played soccer and then had to drop off of the, the soccer team. Um, the next week, I joined the chess club, and that was kind of a whole new world for me. Um, a month later, I went to nationals and was basically playing five to six hours a day going forward. I'm kind of like one of those tennis players in you know, the top two, 300, who if they play a true tennis professional like Jokovic or Federer, they get squashed. Mm-hmm. So um, if I played against a grandmaster, I'd have maybe like a 20% chance against them just based on my rating, yellow strength. But yeah, that was kind of my life for a good 15 years as a hobby, um, traveling places and stuff. And then it wasn't until, I want to say, five years ago, I was returning back home from a humanitarian trip in Iraq uh, just during the refugee crisis. I had a stopover in Toronto, uh, and Connie and I played Puerto Rico with my uncle, who's an avid board gamer. So you can totally blame him uh, for getting the, the itch. And it just sparked a whole new interest into games that were not like perfect knowledge. You couldn't blame yourself for uh, for losing, you know, there's a bit of luck and maybe a card pull or other players have different strategies. And it just, uh, you know, evoked a sense of like, this is crazy. There's 20 new games coming out a day on any theme. <laughs> so we hopped on to Kijiji, which is like Craigslist, bought like 30 used board games the next week. And then just like, you know, had the first year as a gamer of consuming everything you can and trying to figure out your sweet spot. So fascinating so i want to hear more about this this chess uh experience you had sure yeah um what what was your el your, your elo rating at, yeah so i guess it would be at a, its peak sure i guess in canada um about 2350 wow so yeah like a, a national master i'm more of like a, an online blitz player um, okay. my mom's a piano teacher so she taught me how to move my hands fast <laughs> like one minute games all that kind of stuff so uh, those usually go between 25 to 2600, um, but online's a little bit higher in that sense. So. Sure, yeah, yeah. And, and, and just for those who maybe don't know the point of reference for ELO ratings in chess, what Carlson's, what, 2850? Yeah, he's dipped a little bit. Around there, highest ever. And what, anything over 2000 is considered like Expert. really good, really yeah. good at chess. Um, so I guess it would be like, the top 99.9 percentile on chess.com mm-hmm. uh but again like i don't stand a chance against the super grandmasters um i have a lot of friends who are grandmasters who stream on twitch you know i met hikaru and eric hansen from chess bra uh, i actually coached him for a bit we're really good friends here in calgary oh that's great so, uh, the botez sisters mm-hmm. yeah you know we played games and tournaments and stuff so we're, we're all like a really tight community like the board game world where you go to a tournament in Reykjavik and then you fly somewhere else and it's the same camaraderie and uh, tournaments will go for like a week mm-hmm. because you're playing one game a day. So it might typically be at 4 or 6 p.m. in the evening. And if you're really studious, you'll be researching databases and your opponent's special opening lines for the rest of the day or going sightseeing and enjoying foods and stuff. So very similar to board game cons. Yeah, that's that's incredible. And in again, for anyone listening, if you want to watch some fun chess streams, all those people you mentioned, I've watched their streams. Hikaru is hilarious. The Botez sisters are super fun. I've watched Eric some. Mm-hmm. Do you stream? Um, I'm about to. Oh, like I'll <laughs> like of all the things, you know, we we have a list of things to do. But yeah, I've been meaning to for a while. I'm just not sure if you know the board game community would want to see me play chess but I, i'm really looking forward to it we actually put our twitch link at the bottom of the kickstarter page in anticipation of maybe a few streams this month or going forward i'd love to you know coach a bit i was doing that 
for a little bit when Connie and I got married. Yeah, and there's tons of board games on Board Game Arena, Tabletopia. Mm-hmm. So we have a, a nice private community on Facebook, and it would be awesome just to play some other games with people. Yeah, yeah. And chess streaming is like blowing up. Like totally. I, my friend got me, he's like, oh, here, watch this Hikaru guy. He's like one of the best players <laughs> in the world. And, you know, he's like a, he's a super fast with a blitz and rapid specialist, I think also yes. is considered. Yeah. Top two in the world. Yeah. Him and him and Magnus are, are considered the best two. Yeah. And uh, so I, there was a solid like three months where that's all I was watching was his streams. <laughs> and then uh, it started getting really popular. And then of course uh, the, the Netflix series, the Queen's Gambit made yes. just so good. blow up a bit. And it seems to be, I, I never would have predicted that like, I'd go on Twitch and like chess is the second most watched thing at the moment. Right? Right? <laughs> it's crazy. Yeah. Um, a month ago I saw Hikaru streaming and I was like, Oh, he's playing in a uh, chess 960 uh, or Fisher random. That's where all the pieces are randomized on the bottom row. So I joined the tournament and then got paired with him right away. So I was like, babe, go bring the iPad. Like, <laughs> let me know what Hikaru is saying. Yeah, so that was kind of surreal. Like the chess world is super accessible where you could play Magnus Carlsen and maybe steal a pawn off with him and then get crushed. Like <laughs> just like a really cool cerebral experience. And because we can play the game so fast, it introduces um, more interesting things and mistakes and big swings, um, people having a comeback or whatnot. So it's mm-hmm. been fun. Yeah, because uh, what I've heard, I've heard talk of this a little bit, and correct me if I'm wrong, but it seems like a lot of high-level chess players are starting to prefer the faster formats because like traditional games are so so much just trying to find the computer move and like just there's way more draws than there used to be. It's really really fine tuned like openings are, are are really even more so than maybe the couple decades ago are really fine-tuned whereas you play blitz or rapid and stuff can happen that is unexpected and it's like oh wow was that a mistake or are they doing something i don't know is is that totally. the experience you've had yeah that's a very good way to to summarize it um i mean in junior high i bought like 10 books on one opening the french defense so I've been studying that for like a couple decades and you have to like refresh your notes and okay, maybe on move 12 in the Larson variation or the advanced pawn, like what is the structure that I need to achieve? And it becomes more like research and they don't hand out PhDs for, for studying chess openings. So um, speaking to Eric and other professionals, like um, it becomes such a grind just trying to innovate at that level and then pure memorization. Um, Magnus Carlsen has probably the best memory out of all the world chess players. A common thing he'll do is someone will open up a chess book and look at a position and set it up on the board and he'll tell the person what tournament it's from, who played it, and in which round. And, and this could be like from a 1943 game. I just saw a video where he did that. this. Yeah. Yeah. And he's at the barber, right? And people are like, hey, what about this position? Or you see him like look away and they're like, what are you thinking about? He's like, well, you know, this game from two years ago, I don't know if on move 32, that was a good, you know, pin with the bishop on h6 or something, right? And like, even as a chess player, that just blows my mind. It took a good two years to play chess blindfold um, because you can start to see the the board visually in your mind, kind of like um, in the Queen's Gambit, right? She's looking at the ceiling and the mm-hmm. pieces are moving. It becomes a language, but yeah, some people, they just, it's a phenomenal gift and their memory is insane. Yeah, I don't know if, you, if you've if you seen the one I saw the other day. I think it's pretty pretty new from a couple of days ago. But the wildest thing, they throw a couple of weird ones at him, like the, like the game from Harry Potter. One point, <laughs> the guy starts the opening and it's like, it was just two mirror. It was like I, I forget what's the, what's the like the most common the pawn move is what? king's pawn or queen's pawn. Yeah, one of those two pawns, and then they mirrored it, and he's like, "Oh, it has to be this one guy." And right. like, how <laughs> isn't that the most common opening in chess? How are you guessing <laughs> what <laughs> the player is after these two moves? And it, and he was correct. It was wild. So yeah, I mean, 
the world of chess and these perfect information games, you know, I mean, chess and go being the, the two most popular, um, totally. compared to like the board gaming hobby, it seems like you've kind of embraced both sides of it because they are very different, right? Chess, especially if you're playing well. Mm-hmm. I mean, for me, chess, I just, I just do stuff I'm like, oh, I lost that way, and I, I'm horrific. <laughs> I'm so bad at chess. Um, I, I, but totally you know, if you're if you're actually good at chess, right? It's it is a it's it's a different experience than playing a Euro game. Uh, yeah, yes and no. I would say, um, well, even going back to your point of the player knowing who the other player was, uh, you start to see like patterns of personality and play. Mm-hmm. So although it is a perfect information game. Um, it's quite nebulous sometimes what the best move is. And you might have something where, um, like I was in a situation where I was half a point back from the leader of a tournament, so I had to win this crucial last game. And I had the white pieces, and it's, it's a six-hour game, so you try to surprise them and take them out of the element. You you go down a different path just to try to mix things up. Um, you might not play the best move, but you're playing the best situational move based on your opponent. So I think... The board games that we play, at least the modern ones, they can have that same weight where do I play a little bit more aggro right now to disrupt my person's plans? Or um, maybe I don't show all my strength right away if I'm playing Settlers because it has king making and everyone's going to gang up on me. So I'm just going to buy that development card and kind of, you know, massage the advantage or something. So, yeah, I think there are some similarities, but totally it it is a different world where you can just blame yourself on the worst move. Like I dropped my queen. Well, you know, it wasn't a dice that I was rolling. So there, there is a bit of overlap, but definitely I, I'm preferring the modern board games these days. Interesting. But don't get me wrong. Still playing Blitz like every day, a couple <laughs> games. You know, I got to get my fix. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, that, that, I never thought of it that way before because on this podcast, we've had discussions, uh, particularly when my wife Amber comes on, uh, because me and our immediate, other than Amber, the rest of most of the rest of our play group that are playing games are fairly analytical and technical and like counting points. And, you know, we like the Euro games. Right. Uh, we like all kinds of games, but even, even on the game, like Twilight Imperium, we're still mm. trying to optimize. And then Amber yep. plays almost entirely by intuition and is always thinking about the other players over whatever the optimal move is on the board and we've had some interesting discussions on how she ends up being sneakily successful just because she has such a different approach that we yes. aren't we don't have that frame of reference to understand it's like no clearly that's not the right move and then somehow down the line it ends up working out uh to her advantage so i f- i've never thought of it that that chess once you get to a high enough level turns back into that a bit it totally does. And it goes back to player preferences. Um, yeah, I know for myself, I would definitely be a more intuitive player just because I've read so much about chess that you kind of pull different information facts from different openings and you can adjust yourself. Uh, whereas um, a lot of players do the opposite and group memorization informs their decisions and they can play just as good as the world champion for the first 10, 15 moves. Because it's the same game, right? You're just uh, doing that. And, and that's totally a valid form of success as well. For me, I struggle with calculations because I'm not, you know, doing my my daily Wheaties, eating my oatmeal of 10 tactics puzzles in the morning and, you know, figuring out things quickly. Like I kind of feel out the position and I know what's going on and I selectively calculate. Whereas other people, like that's their bread and butter. It reminds me actually of, when Gary Kasparov talked about his match against Deep Blue in the 90s, that was the supercomputer with IBM. Um, that's when computers started to dominate the chess scene and your phone right now could beat the world champion in a, in a match just because the way that we've filtered what the best moves are plus calculations, a human can't stand up to that, that kind of force. So um, it's fascinating looking at a decision-making model of how a human selects chess moves we actually just kind of filter everything down to the top three. So I'm not sitting there looking at the board and being like, I can move my queen one space. 
and that pawn can take it. I can also move my queen this other space and a pawn will take it. Um, a computer will have to go through and crunch all of those possibilities and then it'll start Xing off which ones and it'll eventually come down to the top two or three moves. But just because we as humans in games, we, we intuitively figure out what the best models are. I mean, even driving that happens, right? A guy's coming in from the left, well, maybe I should move over or I can't go into the lane. Like, we intuitively know that, then that informs what we do in the future. So, yeah, sorry, I'm a little rambling a bit, but yeah, intuition is awesome. Yeah, no, yeah, that's that's super cool. Yeah, because the computers do have to like process through all of the obviously bad, mo- like that. Yeah, yes. humans will have just an eye. Well, clearly, it's not any of these without even thinking about it. Because I've watched like some example. I assume the the best chess computer uses like machine learning. Yeah, so neural networks yeah. in the last few years with AlphaGo mm-hmm. um, from Google, that is uh, revolutionary. So it's changing the strength of supercomputers in chess and in other games. Um, we solved checkers about 10 years ago just through brute force. There's a computer that was running for a couple decades in a university, crunching every possibility. Um, but chess doesn't have that because it's logarithmic mm-hmm. with the possibilities. Um, but yeah, it, it works in the reverse as well, where a human won't notice a crazy move, right? It won't notice that queen running down the board and giving itself up to four different pieces because um, the brain doesn't filter that. And then it's also just insane. Like you'd have to calculate the four different pieces taking it out and it's a waste of time. Mm-hmm. But that actually might be the best move in the position. So it's quite obvious when uh, someone's cheating in chess because they play non-human moves and they also take five to 10 seconds of their time. It, they're consulting they take the computer's time. thinking time. Yeah, I've seen that on yeah. streams. They're like, yeah, this guy's cheating. <laughs> right. Because <laughs> this is because it was like a forced move and they still took 10 seconds. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, you yeah. take my pawn and hmm, I guess I won't take your pawn. I'll go sacrifice a piece and win 10 moves later. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, because because from what I understand with with machine learning is that you know I've seen representations of it solving like simple tasks and you know at the beginning you know it the the whole point of it is that you give it a way to grade outputs and then it just throws out inputs at random and then mm-hmm. deletes all the bad ones based on your your criteria and then starts at the starting point that they had and it throws out a bunch of randomness and it keeps doing that millions and billions of times and. Yeah, it's, it's such a fascinating thing that it's using computers to think in a way that compu- only computers are good at. Like humans couldn't process information that way, which is why intuition is great because it's kind of doing that for us of getting rid of clearly the bad options. Uh, but then for computers to excel at that kind of thing, they have to run through so many iterations. But fortunately, computers are very good at running through billions of mindless iterations. Yeah, I was talking to the developers of um, the upcoming Gaia project app, and they're actually using neural networks to try to... Um, oh, fascinating. Have, yeah, better strategic ways of playing against humans. Um, some games kind of like... Uh, let's go back to Puerto Rico. From what I have read, um, 20 years ago, there was an opening system to what are the best moves for Puerto Rico. So like, if you were the fourth or fifth player, you have... X percentage of winning this game. Um, just because you're starting there and player one and two can go for like a wheat strategy or you know figure out things very easily. So these are ways that you can combat that first player advantage and so forth. So games like Gaia Project or Terra Mystica, like just because they're so popular, they start to get that pedigree of chess opening um, knowledge as well. So yeah, it's neat to see, I guess, different publishers and app developers and other people in the board game world trying to make things interesting and fresh again. I think replayability is a huge thing going forward and let alone, you know, gamers just opening boxes to play them for the first time. They say the most enjoyment a board gamer receives is opening the shrink wrap on a new game (laughs) and then placing it on the shelf, just psychological studies. And like, that's terrible, but it's also a really cool thing where we, we have a fascination with um, Cult of the New, of course. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it was just for me, it's like the first time I play a game, it's it's a little like I'm tapping into the designer's mind. It's like, okay, 
Mm. You know, the designer and I probably have, you know, at least in terms of board games, a similar frame of reference. What, given this kind of base knowledge of, you know, the 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 modern board game history, what do what are they what are they doing with that? And I, I always find those first couple of plays really interesting. This is kind of a side note in terms of like new strategies developing and new insights into strategies. Uh, one thing I found fascinating is apparently in the last five or six years, maybe a bit longer, uh, a completely new strategy for Twilight Struggle emerged uh, from China. Ch- there's a big Chinese player contingent, and then they developed like in a completely different framework of how to play the game and started really excelling on online tournaments. And now I think it's relatively split between these two fundamental strategy differences. Have you played Twilight Struggle? I don't know how much, how familiar you are with that game. I just a little bit, but yeah, having an internal meta to games based on regions is huge. Yeah. So if I, I, yeah, go for it. And the difference is that, it's just, it comes down to a relatively minor but significant tweak in how they value uh, how they value control versus immediate victory points. So hmm. board control versus cashing out for victory points. And this like new Chinese strategy values victory points just enough more where they really try to, it's almost an aggro play where they rush out, try to rush out an early win on victory points rather than right. maintain board control till the end. But it's it's super cool that like a game you know that at this point is sixteen seventeen years old uh you know that's not a like perfect information game like like chess or go is is coming up with new strategies that are succeeding yeah and you kind of play against um who you play against in a way so right yeah um when I played chess in Germany um people were very solid and they wouldn't give up gambited pawns. Like they would prefer very strategic ways that didn't give up a lot. Whereas if I played in an open tournament in the States, um, because the prize funds are so big, it incentivized playing for wins right away. So they give up a couple pawns in the opening and it's very like a swashbuckling, you know, go big or just lose out of the opening right away. The same would be in like StarCraft where, you know, the Zergs do a rush, but then a few years later, you might have an influential player change that meta where you don't have to rush as a Zerg. You don't have to pay, uh, play what the uh, original designers thought is the best strategy. You can mix it up a bit. Uh, or League of Legends, all these things. Based on different country regions, that's how they develop meta. Yeah, it's really cool. The closest I've come to that kind of thing personally was when I was playing Netrunner, and I got into it a couple years after. Mm. But reading reading back on some of the, like the influential articles in the early part of the game, there's one that have you have you played netrunner um just once just once um, okay so there's this one faction called jinteki that was considered to be quite weak at the beginning uh portion of the game you know or just a few expansions out until this one guy wrote an article defending a particular strategy with jinteki where you just slowly wear down the runner uh, and it became like a thousand cuts deck, they called it. I, I can't remember. What, he called uh-huh. it something differently, I think. But the idea of, because Jinteki is all about mind games. They're all about putting things on the board face down that you don't know if it's going to be, you know, points or if it's going to be a trap. Right. And everyone thought, well, that's, you know, that's so variable. You can't use it at high level play because it's, you're just giving it, you're just creating randomness for yourself and you want to be able to control the game at high levels. That huh. was the thinking until he pointed out that the the runner's deck and hand of cards is also a resource you can manipulate um, because when you take damage in that runner, you lose cards from hand. If you lose all your cards from hand plus one, you you die, and you, that's one of the win conditions. But Jinteki doesn't do that. It gets rid of like a card here and a card there. And then he wrote this big old long article about how that's actually a tempo loss in a resource you can manipulate to your advantage with this style of deck and just completely change the perception of Jinteki going forward. I don't know. I find that those kinds of developments so fun and so interesting. <laughs> and it's much easier to process for me when it's like a, a, a modern board game. You know, I'm hundreds of years and many, many, a lot of practice behind being able to do that for like chess at this point. But 
or to even understand what is what has happened in the development of like chess openings or whatever uh but there's so much opportunity now with the board games we have to seek out and mm-hmm. develop strategies that way yeah, yeah it really would be a great question example. based on that but i just wanted to throw that out there that no, I think totally. it's super fun yeah uh root or the scythe factions right where um sometimes you even have to ban different combos mm-hmm. um i used to play hearthstone quite a bit until it became a little bit more pay to win but yeah the different aggro control decks or rangers shooting from afar like yeah, there's just so much richness to how game mechanics impact each other. I wanted to ask you, so we talked about uh, we talked about your experience with chess, which, again, is, is so cool. Has that background influenced either, or to your, to your perception, has it influenced either what you have enjoyed in modern board games and or the way you approach designing modern board games? Yeah, yeah. Um, well, I guess in the business world, people always put chess on the pedestal. Like, hey, if you're a good chess player, then you're good at everything at life or making money or something. <laughs> <laughs> and I wish that was true. But yeah, I think it's probably just more of an analytical game. But because I'm more of a, you know, let's figure out what the theme of the chess position is and then be really fundamental in principles. Like, let's try to go for that and then break the rules. Like, you're supposed to castle. We tell beginners within the first seven to ten moves if you're one move away from castling your king is safe if you're two moves away from castling and like you got to get a bishop or a knight out of the way then you're not so safe and if you're three moves away your king's in big danger so just kind of running off of different um fundamentals can get you a long way and i think as a designer i'm trying to figure out what that means in the board game world so you know whether it's studying um the other day we're looking at all the worker placements we have like a medium weight euro coming down the road and that's kind of our sweet spot worker placements um so t for two has dice workers but it's not truly uh, uh you know asymmetric play with different you know player board powers that are going to do some incredible things way down the road and you have to ramp up something for you know 90 minutes into the game when it all comes together and then the champions of midgard can go and conquer some dragon or something so yeah, I, I'd like to think that it, it does. I think it probably just gives me maybe a little bit more confidence that, hey, I've played chess for a while. Why can't we make other cool games too? So, and of course, your brain's always thinking, how could I make chess better? Or <laughs> what would be an awesome abstract to make? But at the end of the day, I think um, one game designer said that all games are actually abstracts. You strip away the theme and you really look at the core of it. It does come down to just those fundamentals. Um, we picked up uh, Ingleston's fundamentals of game mechanics or game designs recently on Kindle. Uh, looks like a solid, you know, 700 page read, but it it reads like a chess manual, and that is a comfortable thing. So that's the the mechanics, the like the big list of mechanics one. Yeah, with different yeah. examples, and yeah, he yeah. has his own iconography. It's a great resource. Yeah, that excites uh, me. <laughs> in terms of what you what you seem to enjoy in modern board games have you found any trends there or are you just kind of gobbling up everything you can i i just love input um <laughs> you know there's a, a strength finder personality test by gallup and i'm like ideation connectedness that's why i'm pretty random um and input so like i love just playing as much as i can trying to do two new games a week just to have you know some more flavor that informs future game design. Uh, we're still a small publisher, relatively new, so I can't you know, just make new games every day, but we got a couple of notepads full of stuff. And um, Connie is more of like an architect and looks at graphic design and layouts and stuff. So we have a really good uh, working relationship in that sense. She's a full-time teacher, but when she comes home, we'd be like, hey, what do you think about this component? Or um, this might be a cool little thing of a hook. and. She's the one that'll say, yeah, that's not going to work or that doesn't make sense or love it. Let's try to pursue this. And although we focus on game design quite a bit, as I think the publisher world, probably product design is becoming increasingly important to if you have fur on the box, right? Um, That is a bigger hook than maybe what the cards do in the game. Like there's just so many unique ways you can grab people. So 
like chai is a great family game, but people love the little terracotta plastic cups that they're tactilely stacking on top of each other. And, you know, we've seen people have tea parties with them. Like it's just a cool cup, but that can be a hook and a really cool thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's all, it's also helps. I think also that you have a very, like the art you got for the game is, is really friendly, I guess it's, it, it's comforting. Like it looks like, you know, what you're, you know, the experience that you're going to have with the game, which I think, a lot of games are trying to do that and don't quite get there. Like, I think the art's a tricky thing. Thank you. Yeah, I guess it came down to Sahana doing an amazing job. And we would give one or two paragraphs for each card of this is what we envision. Can you make that accessible and friendly and vibrant? So explaining before you make a game, what, what do you want the experience to be? We always talk about theme and then design. But... People are moving towards experience-based games. What kind of feelings or emotions do you want to evoke when you play? And for us, that included um, even inclusivity. We had someone post the other day, thank you so much for putting the one smiling girl in a wheelchair as one of the chai cards. Just because um, that was something really dear to our heart and Connie's a special needs teacher. So um, totally, like we need to celebrate this in the board gaming world, um, different diversity of playing groups, all that sort of thing. So. Yeah, just there's creative ways to, to make things interesting. Mm -hmm. I couldn't talk with you about uh, a game based on tea without nerding out about <laughs> tea for at least a little bit. Uh, obviously, you guys seem like you're fans of tea, having made two games now about tea and an expansion. I'm curious what your favorite tea is. Um, it was really funny because in our first campaign, Harney and Sons from the States reached out to us, and they're like, we want to make you... Tea influencers, tea influencers. <laughs> and they sent us like 500 bucks worth of tea. And we're still going through it. Like we have probably 40 tea tins and like two kilograms of peppermint. I don't know how you're going to get through that. Uh, we started making ice cream and putting peppermint into it and chai. Like That works. Yeah. It, it, it's been so much fun just trying new things. And of course, now every birthday and Christmas, people are giving us tea like we haven't <laughs> had before. <laughs> Uh, but for me personally, I really enjoy probably a London Fog if it's a bubble tea. Connie likes tarot. We would love to make a bubble tea game down the road. There's been a lot of cool card games come out recently, so maybe we missed the boat, but I uh, still got to do it down the road. I like, uh, do you know Mountain Greek Tea? Mountain Greek Tea? I do not. Yeah, I'll have to send you a link. It, it's kind of like a really thick root with like chrysanthemum on it. Huh. Uh, I have to find the uh, the proper Latin name for it. So that's been fun. Um, I've been to China quite a few times. Connie was born in Beijing, so fermented tea is starting to become more appealing. Yeah, we, we kind of enjoy everything. I just grew up on peppermint and black tea and yeah, chamomile. Yeah. So it's been really awesome just seeing new things like lapsang souchong and uh, matcha tea. You know, we recently got some of the actual scoops and things. and Yeah, yeah. For those listening, if you have never had Lapsang su Suchong, it is an experience. It's uh, it's straight smoke. Never thought you'd get that from a tea. Uh, yeah, because my tea experience is that I always thought tea was awful because I always just had bad tea. <laughs> um, and then a friend got into Chinese tea and, and made for me this pu'er tea. Uh, mm -hmm. that was aged a good 10, 15 years, which is, I think, awesome. about the sweet spot if you want really nice pu'er. And it blew my mind. I had no idea tea could taste like that. And then I got really into Chinese tea. I, I just kept it to China just to, like, restrain myself kind of <laughs> arbitrarily. Like, okay, we'll explore right. Chinese teas now. I know there's tea all over the place in different variations and types, but I'm going to keep it there uh, just so I don't get overwhelmed. And, yeah, I've been... I've been drinking tea since. Pu'er is still my favorite, though. Good pu'er. It's so if good. It's aged nice. If it's really young and like raw, yeah, it tastes kind of like you're drinking a, a mud puddle. Uh, but <laughs> if you get a if you get one that's good, that's been around a while, oh man, it's there's nothing else like that. Uh, but yeah, enjoy all kinds of teas: black tea, white tea, green tea, all the different uh, kinds. Yeah. Of tea. And uh, not as a, a spoiler, but we'd like to uh, release a board game 
T line in the future. Ooh. Something might be in the works. But that kind of came out of the World Tea Expo being like, hey, there's a competition on innovative tea companies that are under two years old. So we just threw in our hat, the name in the hat. Um, and they said out of the 90 contestants, like Steep Games is the most innovative tea company that's come out. So wow. we've had all these requests from, uh, yeah, like larger brands and different tea shops of how can we carry your products? Um, do you have any dice that have tea on it? All these different things. So I'm not sure how we're going to pivot more into the tea <laughs> world, but <laughs> like we still have all these other cool modern board games to come out that aren't tea related, but um, you definitely got to ride the wave and we love tea. So yeah, we're going down to their expo and hopefully a few months if we can. And yeah. Who knows? It would be a dream to like sign on with Starbucks or David's tea and, you know, do a cool branding or whatnot, but we'll have to see. Yeah, that'd be that'd be super cool, man. I, I really want some tea now. I'm drinking coffee, but now I'm craving tea. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so Chai Tea for Two is currently on Kickstarter. I'll make sure to post the link to that uh, below. Already funded, uh, but still, by the time this podcast posts, you'll have a couple of weeks to look into it and put your pledge in. The original Chai game you can buy from your site, I believe. Yeah, yes, or what happened? Or the pledge manager is a bundle, but mm-hmm. no pressure. And that site is steepedgames.com. Any final thoughts or plugs or pitches you want to throw out here? I know other than just keep enjoying gaming and inviting people to your table. It's been a crazy couple of years to be sure. But yeah, I've seen gamers being super accessible and whether it's sending us notes or we've had online conventions that have been a lot of fun. Yeah, just keep being inclusive in that way. The the pandemic hit hard, obviously, because part of board gaming is playing with other people. But I feel like totally. as a community, we've gotten through and now are now looking at the other side of the pandemic uh, pretty well. I mean, board, online mm-hmm. gaming has emerged. People are making plans now. I see hopefully we, we can get to the point where conventions can start happening the fall, winter, yeah. next early next year. And uh, I'm excited to... Uh, start playing more games in person again thank you so much dan for coming on the podcast this has been a delight no worries and hopefully you can play some chess down the road or anyone listening you know see you on twitch or chess.com or somewhere <laughs> oh yeah yeah be on the lookout for uh dan's twitch channel uh because oh, again chess like rapid or blitz chess on uh twitch is so fun to watch even if you're like me and terrible and don't really know what's happening with some of the (laughs) terminology and strategy that's going out it just it's fast and and exciting curious (laughs) thanks for listening everybody uh again don't forget to check out steeped games click on the kickstarter link below to check out chai tea for two and for more of my stuff, go to thethoughtfulgamer.com. If you'd like to support the podcast, go to patreon.com slash thethoughtfulgamer. And uh, don't forget to rate and review. And uh, we're all on social media, Twitter and, and such. You can find us there. Thanks for listening, everybody. <laughs> Goodbye. <laughs> <laughs>